when I saw this because I'm like, this is my thing. This is my GM. Um, and of course, the technology is starting to be glitchy. Uh, thank you so much for coming. I'm Tina Ellsworth. I'm an <laughs> assistant professor of education here. This is my first year, and I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for being my guinea pigs. Um, I like to get, get out and going right away. So I'm going to start out this talk today um, with a video from a movie called Iron John Angels. Has anybody seen this before? Okay, I'm going to show you just a short clip, and it's going to tie into what we're doing later. I just want you to see this. Hopefully it's going to work. Nope. You expect Negro women to march in a separate unit at the back. Southern suffrage groups threatened to withdraw. Other ladies afraid will launch out of step. Call them what? We can't afford to lose their support, not with the Democrats in office. Who's we? Women? Or just white women? No, wait a minute. We have one agenda suffrage. At another issue, we don't stand up now. What happens to Negro women when you finally get the vote? They'll keep us out of the polling place any way they can. Are the colored groups have agreed to compromise? It's not perfect, but we got to be practical. Dress up prejudice and call it politics. I expected more from a quicker. I'll march with my peers or not at all. I understand. chance to see that film you really need to see it it's very good i can show it to my high school students and i would say how do you know the way you saw in the, in the video was true and so i would send them on this investigation of trying to determine what parts of this movie were true what weren't maybe what were sort of true sort of not true and they started to realize really quickly that a lot of what you just saw is deeply rooted in fact even just from that little clip and so i'm going to share with you a little bit about the history of the of the uh women's suffrage movement, but I'm also going to talk about the parts that are often not told. All right, so before we get started, I wanna know who you are and why you are here. Since we're a smaller group tonight, I'd like to hear from each of you, and even if it's just like my mom made me come, like that's fine. So what's your name, maybe what's your major, and why are you here? Uh, my name is Madeline, I'm an undergraduate major, and I'm here in the Utah, and I used to get a university feeling sometimes a semester, Great. Sounds good to see you. Hello. Um, my name is Sophia Stenner. Um, I'm a student of the Yale Theater. And I'm here partly for the Mr. Fetish, but I also I have to talk about the Congress. All right. Well, glad you're here in the back. Hi, I
dot plus and you know I want to be here tonight. There's all my schedules of occupied wall spots I wanted to do a day. So glad you're here. Go. Thanks. I'm Cindy Shire Kessler. I'm a co-worker with Dr. Ellsworth, but I'm here not because of her. I'm here to learn more about this topic. I don't feel like I know enough. Oh, I'm Dr. Don Gilly. I'm the chair of the Department of Candidates and Social Sciences. Um, I'm a historian, except I do ancient Greece and Rome. So this is all current events to me. Right. Um, <laughs> and um, I'm here because I'm running the tech and because it's history. So That's it's right. my thing. Can't my get jam. enough, right? It's my jam. Yes, sir. Awesome. Great. And um, my name is Maddie Martin. Um, I'm here for multiculturalism and education. And I told Dr. Nelson I would be here. <laughs> I've been asking about it since it got canceled. So postpone. Postpone. So <laughs> I'm Chelsea. I'm an ed major too. And I'm here for a class for multiculturalism and because Maddie gave me no choice. <laughs> <laughs> Own it. Well, I'm glad you're all here. If you want to be able to follow along with the slide deck, you can um, take a take, pick up your phone, take a picture of the QR code. The slide deck will show up on your device. Uh, part of the reason for doing this is because I'm going to show you some primary sources in a little bit to back up my claim, right? The claim that I made that white supremacy existed during the women's suffrage movement. Um, and I want you to tell me, like, do you think I interpreted those primary sources correctly or not? So. We'll spend some time talking about that. So if you'd like to follow along, great. If not, great, it's totally up to you. All right, did it work? Yeah. It worked for me prior to, so okay, good deal. So a little bit of background on me, who I am and how I became interested in this topic. I think it's very important um, for people to know how historians come about their topics, the kinds of questions and inquiry that they were engaged with um, that kind of sent them on this journey. So for me, I was a high school, middle school history teacher for eight years, nine years and uh, in very rural Missouri. And from there, uh, in that time, my bachelor's degree is in social studies education. My master's degree is in history with an emphasis in women's studies in America and black American history, both. So this is the perfect intersection um, based on my interests. And so I then I went to the University of Kansas and got my PhD in social studies education, well, curriculum and instruction with an emphasis in social studies education. So um, I am first and foremost, I mean, I'm an educator, um, and I'm going to talk about my positionality here in just a minute, but um, I was really, fo I focus a lot on anti-racist education. Um, and I became interested in this topic because I, with my anti-racist lens, I always try to find what are the untold stories? Where are the counter narratives? Where is the history and the primary sources that have vanished? Um, or is it that they vanished or is that they just haven't been uncovered? Or maybe they've been uncovered by some and not by others. Maybe it's not a part of the the main story that we hear, the dominant narrative that we hear. And so I became interested in this because if you would have asked me one year ago who some of my heroes were in American history, I would have said Alice Paul. She's a third generation suffragette in the United States. And um, she was a part of the, a group called the National Women's Party that, that were more, um, not violent, but uh, definitely had a different approach to trying to gain suffrage than maybe some of the early suffragists did. And when I started to uncover that some of these women that I had idolized um, actually were engaging in racist rhetoric and blocking people of color from being part of the women's suffrage movement, I thought, oh my gosh, like this is rocking my world. I'm not totally surprised. So then I sent me on a journey to go, I wanted to see if this is true. And I wanted to like, study the, the big women, the, the women that are getting all of the accolades for women's suffrage. And I wanted to see what I could find for those women. And I'm going to take you through a journey. So as a historian, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my journey and how I came to find these things. But then also as a classroom teacher, I'm always thinking, how can I teach teachers how to teach this? How do I teach them how to go through the same top, the same process that I went through so that way they can add these counter narratives to their classroom stories? Okay. Um, and so my positionality, it's really important that we recognize what our current frame is and how it might influence the way that we view the world, we experience the world, and the kind of artifacts that we can counter. So I am a white middle-class female, and that does matter. And it's also caused me to go, you know what, I need to take a deeper look more often at the role of race and racism in anything that I study in US history. 
And so because we know that we have a long standing history of race and racism, and it doesn't just go away overnight. And sometimes we think, oh, that was just a thing of the past. It has nothing to do with today. And I'm going, well, you know, everything about today in order to make sense of today, we have to understand the past to understand how we got here. So racism doesn't just go away, especially when you're talking about a time where this movement started before slavery was even abolished. So of course there's gonna be elements of this showing up, but I'm a social studies teacher. So I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna combine the history and the pedagogy so that hopefully you can teach it to your kids someday for those of you that are uh, education majors. Um, okay, so one of the things I really wanna focus on before we get talking is this idea of erasure. Um, in particular, I'm really gonna focus on black history. Obviously there's a lot of histories that have been erased or removed, but this is the, the idea that Histories by some people aren't preserved because they're not seen as important. People of color a lot of times aren't seen as having made any kind of valuable contribution to the world or to history, and therefore their stories are not remembered. Um, major collections like maybe the National Archives or the Library of Congress, we can get a lot of primary sources that can learn our nation's history, doesn't have a lot of this. And it's because of racism in the past, they would say we literally don't, nobody's keeping the collections, nobody wants the collections. And now with the Library of Congress, for one, which I'll talk about in a little bit, they're actually trying to right that wrong by trying to get their hands on more artifacts from the past about people of color because they recognize that it doesn't exist. So what I just, this is really central to this particular story and, and we'll talk more about why. So the purpose of my investigation here was to look at the role of race and racism in the women's suffrage movement using inquiry, which is basically always asking questions and trying to find answers to those questions using primary sources and counter narratives. And so I think you're gonna see all of those things kind of pop up here today. So we're gonna do this in four parts. One, I'm gonna talk about the inquiry design model for teaching history. Uh, number two, we're gonna look at setting the context. What do textbooks and standards say about women's suffrage? How much of it is actually in there? Three, we're gonna ask the right questions through compelling and supporting questions. How can we guide students on this journey, no matter their age, and lastly, what are some present day connections between this story in the past and today? So let's take a look at the inquiry design model. The National Council for the Social Studies, um, shameless plug, I am on the board of directors for NCSS, but I really believe in the work that they do. Um, in 2013, along with other major organizations in uh, geographic education, economic education, and the like, they came together and they created a model or a framework that says, here's how you should kind of approach social studies education. It's called the C3 framework. The C stands for college, career, and civic life. Because it's this idea that we're not just preparing you for the future, college and career, we're also preparing you to be citizens. And to do that well and to preserve our democracy, we need to make sure that people can, you know, be able to determine what is good evidence, what's bad evidence, if something's reliable, um, if something is believable, and so the more that we can do that from a very young age, then hopefully we have adults that can decipher whether or not that video about there being a microchip in your vaccine is in fact true, <laughs> right? Okay, so this is kind of, this is a template that Dr. Swan and others created to kind of walk us through this inquiry design model. And this is what my talk is really gonna follow. Um, first you say this, this can be done through inquiry. So you're gonna see several different places where we talk about questions. The compelling question, this is the overarching question for this particular lesson. This lesson could take a few days. Generally speaking, you think like a few days within a larger unit, for those of you that are educators, you know what I'm talking about. Um, aligning it to standards, staging your question, that's gonna be your anticipatory set or your hook. And then you go, okay, if that's the question I want kids to be able to answer at the end of this activity, here are three supporting questions that's going to guide them in their journey to getting there. And then here's the formative performance tasks to measure those supporting questions. And then lastly, what are those primary and secondary sources you're gonna put in front of kids to help them answer those questions? Lastly, students are gonna make claims or arguments citing that evidence to answer the compelling question at the top. And then lastly, we want them to take informed action. So um, this is the framework that I'm going to use. You're gonna see me talk about compelling questions, supporting questions, and then you're gonna see the featured sources. And I want you then to tell me what the answer to those questions are, okay? Are you ready? This is gonna be fun. Setting the context. Okay, women's suffrage movement, textbooks and standards. What do you think the standards or textbooks are saying about women's suffrage? Take a stab. Not very much. Probably not much. But it exists. 
that it happened. Yeah. Right? They get like a paragraph in the textbook. It, a, a sentence. Okay, Susan B. Anthony. You might, and you might have even thought. Carrie Woodward? Carrie. No. I, I, she might be Carrie uh, Nation. Seneca Falls. Seneca Falls Convention. I know. Are you like, are these people? There's, are a, there's a Mary Poppins song about it. There is a Mary Poppins song about it. Um, and that is funny because the, the mother in Mary Poppins actually, her last name in real life was my maiden name. So I felt connected to her when I was like four. I'm like, oh, my name. Um, so let's take a look and see what they say. This is just a real cursory glance. Okay, I won't bore you with all of the details. But we looked at, uh, my best friend and I are doing this inquiry together, doing this investigation together. She literally does exactly what I do, has the exact same degrees that I have. Um, and we didn't even meet until well into adulthood. And so she does this exact same job at a university in Texas. So we're like, perfect, let's work on this together. And here, so she's in Texas. And here's what we found. Women's suffrage was mentioned one time in the standards in seventh grade. And all it said was women's suffrage, comma, like a temperance movement, comma. So it was just like a, a concept that was mentioned. And then the word reformers are mentioned. Who were some social reformers, okay? In Missouri, there is no specific mention of suffrage, um, there, but there are reform movements. In the Missouri standards, they also have skills, like can students read and analyze primary sources? Do they know how to conduct social studies research? That kind of thing. But there's no content standard that specifically mentions them um, or any of them, but I think maybe Susan B. Anthony, I'll have to go check, um, but she might be the only one. And in text, well, we go to Kansas here. In Kansas, there's no content standards whatsoever. They're all entirely skills based. So, talking about these larger topics in history education, like continuity and change over time, historical significance, these kinds of things, is all that their standards say. And even in their appendices, where they have suggested curriculum, you don't see any mention of women's suffrage. And then we looked at three different textbooks. And what we found is it was a very white centered story. Unsurprising, it's the white women whose stories are always getting told. Um, and a lot of times, even famous black suffragists like Ida B. Wells was only talked about within her anti lynching campaign and not necessarily as a suffragist. So that's really interesting that she's only associated with issues that maybe specifically pertain to black people. Okay. Maybe. All right. So where do teachers go to find that content knowledge then? Because if you're using the standards to help guide some of your decisions about the content that you're teaching, especially if you don't feel like, oh, I don't really have a lot of content knowledge in this area, where do I go? A lot of teachers are going to go to places like the standards. They're going to go to the textbooks. And then they might go to the Library of Congress, maybe the National Archives, and try to see what things are there that we can learn about. And so if you were to look at the Library of Congress, they have an exhibit online that's actually a replica of what you could see if you went there in person. I actually got to go see this exhibit in person a couple of years ago, um, commemorating the passage of the 19th Amendment. Um, and so you'll see if you click on any of these five thumbnails, it'll take you into a whole host of things about women's suffrage. Do you maybe see a trend in the thumbnails that were chosen here, which we'll talk more about in a little bit. So this is where a lot of teachers may go to get this information and to try to learn more. So how are we going to ask the right questions and use evidence to answer them? So the C3 framework, you can do this. You can use that document in a few different ways. It could be just a guideline for you to use. Um, it could be something that you give kids. It could be really structured. You give them the questions and you give them the artifacts that they come up with their answer. But as you can slowly let go and maybe see if kids come up with their own questions that they want to find their own answers to in the ways that historians do. So here's my compelling question for this, let's say, four-day lesson I might do with kids. Say, is the story of women's suffrage movement honest? What are your initial reactions to that kind of question? I mean, yeah, you would think so, but probably learn. Okay, because if a teacher told you it must be true, right? Although if you're asking that question, it makes me think no. Ah, so it could get students going, wait a second. So there's a chance that it's not true. 
And so, may, and so hopefully the question is compelling that they're like, I want to find an answer to that question. I want to find an answer. What do you mean? So it might be, it might not be, how do I find the answer to that question? Okay. So um, here are my three supporting questions. So I kind of approach this a little more from a structured inquiry perspective. I want students to go through kind of the same steps I had. These are questions I had. My first question was, what is the dominant narrative about women's suffrage that gets reported in schools? And then what were black women doing at the time in suffrage? Because something tells me they were doing something. And obviously because I have a master's degree in that, I know a little bit more about maybe what they were doing. So I had this natural inclination to go, okay, I wanna know more about that. And then here's the thing I started that somebody dangled in my in front of me and said, did you know that somebody said this? Like one of your suffragists said this anti-black statement. And I'm like, okay, so how was it active among those well-known white suffragists? Was it just that one? Was it more than one? Were they deliberately kept out of the conversation? What did that look like? So these are the three supporting questions that I'm gonna put in front of students. I'm gonna pose these questions to you. I'm gonna show you some artifacts and I'm gonna see if you can answer these questions by the time we're done here. Okay, so with the person just next to you, and if you wanna join Dr. Ross or something, you're more than welcome. Um, but what is the dominant narrative about women's suffrage? What do you already know? So just turn and talk real quick. What do you already know about women's suffrage? I'm sure there could have been. If we certainly know that there are elements of that. Really? Okay. Not to the degree of Eric Dawson, but yes. Era or the women's suffrage movement. Does anybody know who this woman is? It is not. It's not Mott. It's not Mott. <laughs> this is Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And she was one of the chief authors of the Declaration of the Sentiments. Um, were that was presented at the women's rights convention so on the right hand side you see a copy of the declaration of sentiments where basically they took the declaration of independence and everywhere where it said we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal they added and women so we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal they went through the whole document and they added that and then they went through you know how in the declaration of independence we had like the the founders had these grievances against king george well, they did the same thing. We're like, well, let's tell you about the grievances now against our own government and about how we're not being treated equitably. So a lot of times when you hear about the women's suffrage movement, they start 1848 with the Seneca Falls Convention. Look at all the ladies that showed up. Look at all the gentlemen that showed up. Um, so that alone could be a really fun inquiry to go, oh, who are these people who showed up and what did they do after that? So letting the primary sources cause you to ask more questions to then go and continue to learn more about it. So the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848, and then Stanton meets Anthony in 1851. And the two of them not only are fighting for abolition of slavery, they're not only fighting for temperance, like the eradication of alcohol, but they're also fighting for women's suffrage. And so they're going all around the country. This is a ticket to be able to go in and see Susan B. Anthony's lecture talking about women's suffrage. Um, and so they go all around the country and they do this. Then um, they create their own newspaper. And you can see you know, women who led nationwide fight for women's suffrage. And what do you notice about the picture here? They seem pretty white. They seem pretty white. They're clearly upper class. Yeah, you probably inferred that they are. There's the jewelry, there's nicer outfits. There's a different. Is it ages to say they look older? 
No. I think some of them do. I think some of them, yeah, it's hard to tell on some of them. But you know what's so fun? When students ask questions about primary sources and you don't know the answer, you can say, I don't know, that's a fun question. Let's see if we can look that up again. Let's see if we can find out some more. Okay, so these are the women, Carrie Chapman Cat, who's in the center here. She is the one who is the president of the National American Women Suffrage Association at the time. Um, I'm trying to see if there's any of the other names of people that you might have heard of before. That's the Carrie I was thinking of. Carrie Chapman Cat. Okay. Then they went through a state by state campaign. You might you might remember that there were some states out in the West that had granted suffrage to women before. And this picture is very symbolic of, you know, votes for women is kind of marching across the country. And these women are like, save us, like come help us keep moving this way. And it was a state by state campaign as initially, as opposed to just trying to get an amendment to the United States Constitution, because that could be way harder to do. So instead, if you can get the states to do it a little bit at a time, um, then they thought that they would be more successful. So what you can see here is women vote in all the white states. Why not ours? The vote was given to women in these states in these years. Um, why do you think it was these states and not others? Wait, think. No wrong answer to just guess what you think. Way to boost their population, mm. their census count. Oh, so maybe it would draw more women out to those areas. Well, great. but no, but also to like more votes for electoral college. And oh. Mm. And they're all pretty much Western states. Mm -hmm. That would make sense. Because there, what what we do know is that there were a lot of men that were moving out that way at the time, and they were actually like writing up, um, oh gosh, we were like classified ads trying to get women to move out west. And so I do wonder if maybe this played into luring women out west. I don't know, but that's kind of a fun thing to investigate further. Oh, the mail order bride thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There have been complaints later on about the women in Wyoming. The type of women that are moving out west are independent women, not willing not to get married. <laughs> the ones that don't want to marry you. trying to do is to do where women out to Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, and why Wyoming was in 1869, and the problems that are associated with that, um, that were dated, realized in 1869. Love that. That's so cool. I love talking to historians. Um, and then Miss Alice Paul, she's the third generation suffragette that I was just talking to you about. So this is her route of envoys that was sent back and forth um, in order to appeal to voting women of the West because um, they wanted to assemble and come to Chicago to launch a national women's party. So there was some infighting between the women about which approach should we take. Should we go more state by state or should we go federal and then man, there was infighting and this is the third generation going, you know what? Older ladies, you did your job. Let us take the torch and they're going to go and they're going to form their own party. Okay. The procession, which is what you saw in the video when we first started. Yes, sir. Can you go back to slide? Yes. All right. So on to, to add to that slide. Yes. Um, this is a railroad map. And what they would do is every place on every stop on that railroad is where she would give a speech calling for women's suffrage. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton does the same thing going through Nebraska. And she has a definitive route, a railroad circuit that she follows. And at the railroad station, there were it was a whistle stop kind of tour, and she'd be giving speeches to big, large crowds to try and encourage uh, women's suffrage movement. Awesome. Look at that. This is why it's so fun to get in a room with a bunch of historians <laughs> who, know, who know like even more stuff about different stuff. So this is the official program of the women's suffrage parade that you saw in the video when we started. So this was in 1913. It was very perfectly timed to align with Wilson's inauguration back in those days. The inauguration happened in March after the election. And they thought, hey, all of these huge crowds are already going to descend on Washington, D.C. Let's have a parade bringing more attention to women's suffrage, right? So this is the entire program. So did you do you remember seeing the woman on the white horse at the beginning? I don't know if you remember that. Um, she was on there at the beginning. But when you open up this program, this is what you see. You see a uh, bio about Alice Paul. You see a bio about Lucy Burns. Here's Carrie Chapman Cat. Remember, she was the president of NASA. 
Uh, Anna Howard, Dr. Anna Howard Shaw is also featured here and about the purpose of this event. And then we've got more women that are highlighted. What do you notice? Obviously know the, the title of my talk, but as I was then went back and started looking at these things, I was like, how did I miss this? How did I miss how white this was? Um, and so this is the story that we are told. Here's Inez Milhall, and she's the woman on the horse who was at the front of the parade and led the procession. Um, this is a picture of the parade from March 3rd, 1913. You see the women who are wearing black are the college uh, educated folks. And then you've got, they have it kind of broken down into different groups of women as they kind of go down and you can see the Capitol building. These are people that were in a neighboring state that were on their way to the procession. Again, not that you can necessarily guarantee the race of every single person in these photographs, but I'm seeing the trend. And I'm getting 99% of these artifacts from the Library of Congress. So again, if I'm a classroom teacher, I want to learn more about the event and I go to a collection and I'm not careful to notice that, oh my gosh, this is predominantly white. I might give off the impression that only white people were involved in the suffrage movement at the time. Women also engaged in these silent sentinels where they would hold these signs up, quoting the president in a lot of times, but this is during World War I is going on. We're claiming to be fighting for democracy overseas from Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany. And we're now referring to President Wilson as Kaiser Wilson. Like you're going over there claiming to fight for democracy, but like, hello, we still can't vote. Right? So they were in his business. And they were there like every single day, rain, snow, doesn't matter how hot, how cold it was, until eventually um, they started to be arrested um, for obstructing. Um, one of the reasons why they were. So here's what we know. We know the existing narrative is incomplete. There's, there's no way, and I, again, I already knew about Black people that were involved in the suffrage movement, and I'm going, I'm seeing all these things. I'm hearing this dominant narrative, and it's basically what I just told you. So all these white women that are working for suffrage, getting the state-by-state -state campaign, eventually getting, getting the, a constitutional amendment ratified, and even the parade, which was a really big deal, the Silent Sentinels were a big deal. So it's incomplete because whose story is not there is basically anybody who wasn't white. So I got really curious, like, where were they? So how were Black women active at the time? What do you know, turn off? What do you know about what Black women were doing during the women's suffrage movement? Okay, I will argue that the so it's like we're talking about the new laws, but they're not actually saying white white women. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you know what's so fun about that? I asked that question and it was silent. Did you notice? That right there is usually demonstrative that we don't know anything. Then the question needs to be why are we not learning that? Is it, is it truly because they were not active? They were not doing anything. There is nothing to report. Or could it be that there's bias in our collections, that there's bias in our standards, that there's bias in our textbooks? All right, well, let's take a look. You tell me how were Black women suffrage at, uh, active at the time. So Frances Ellen Watkins Harper gives a speech in the 1950s called We Are All Bound Up Together. Um, she actually has a marker in her hometown that says that she is an author, a lecturer, a social activist. She lived here and devoted her life to championing the rights of slaves and free Blacks. She advocated education as a way for advancement of Black Americans. And I'm going to play with you. Um, this is from, I wish I could look, but I can't because I'm going to lose my mouse. I have all of these sources cited in the notes section, so you can always go back and look. This is a reenactment of her speech. And I'm just going to play like 30 seconds of it. I feel I am something of a novice upon this platform. I do not believe that white women are dewdrops exhaled from the skies. I think that like men, they can be divided into three classes the good, the bad, and the indifferent. The good will vote according to their convictions and principles, the bad, as dictated by prejudice or malice. And the indifferent will vote on the strongest side of the question. 
the winning party. So she's giving a speech at a, the 11th Women's Suffrage Convention alongside Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. But yet her name is not as well known. She's presenting on suffrage at the exact same places at the exact same times in the mid 1800s. Mary, uh, not March Church Terrell, I was distracted. Mary Church Terrell uh, was an incredible activist, forms the Federation of Colored Women, becomes the president of it, quickly realizes that the intersection of race and gender come into play for her where she starts to realize it doesn't matter how hard I work for suffrage. I am not accepted by men and much like all the other women, but I'm also not accepted by white women because I'm black. So then she said, you know what? We need to just focus on the efforts of black women and lifting up black women and elevating black women. And so that's what she devoted her life to doing. She still fought for suffrage. She was at the silent sentinels, but I couldn't find a single picture of it anywhere. But if you were just to Google silent sentinels, you're going to find a ton of pictures. But I, for about eight months, have tried to find one of Mary Church Terrell because there's a lot of artifacts that say she was there, but I can't find any photographs of any of them. That's another very curious thing to me. So Mary Church Terrell is very, very well known. She's starting these clubs all over the country um, and to get Black women activated and um, fighting for suffrage. You also have the Greater State Women's National Baptist Convention. So you've got Black women who are showing up in solidarity, fighting for women's suffrage, even in their religious spaces. This is a letter from Nellie Quander, president of AKA, to Alice Paul. So Alice Paul is planning this parade that you just saw. She writes a letter to Alice, and I'm pulling out a quote from this that you can see here. And she says, hey, who would like to participate in your parade? We do not wish to enter if we must meet with discrimination on account of race affiliation. Can you assign us to a desirable place in the college women's section? So she's even saying, hey Alice, we wanna march with you and be in solidarity with you, but if you're gonna put us in the back of the line, no thanks. Like we're not gonna let you do that to us. We're college educated, we wanna be in the college educated section of the parade, don't stick us in the back. Okay, so this is the Deltas. The Deltas actually ended up marching. I cannot find any evidence as to whether or not Nellie did, um, but the Deltas did march with the college educated women in the parade because it was negotiated by Inez Milholland, the woman on the horse, and Mary Church Terrell. The two of them got together and they negotiated it and these women participated in that, um, in that parade in the college educated section. So again, Mary Church Terrell shows up as being an advocate and being involved in the parade. Ida B. Wells, she's somebody I mentioned earlier. Um, she was the black woman who was in the video that you saw where she said, I want to march with my peers or not at all. So this is an artifact students would find where Ida B. Wells actually said, either I go with you or not at all. I'm not doing it for the future, but, or I am doing it for the future benefit of my whole race. She actually ended up marching with the Illinois delegation, as opposed to being in the back where a lot of the black women were marching. Ida B. Wells is very prominently uh, talked about in textbooks related to the anti-lynching campaign that she did. Um, and so you'll see her name sometimes in the state standards, but I did not find them in those three states as it related to suffrage. Okay, a witness at that parade said, Suddenly, from the crowd on the sidewalks, Miss Garnett walked out calmly to the delegation and assumed her place at the side of Mrs. Squire, who was a white ally. So this is a reporter from the Chicago Tribune. So what we saw in that video was pretty darn true. She walked out, she got right up in her place, and then she was flanked by two white women who were allies who were one, we'll go with you. Okay, that's maybe what Bettina Love is talking about with co-conspirators. Who's willing to go out there? Who's willing to take risks? Um, in the same way that they take risks. But she's like, I'm just going to call me walk out there and I'm going to do it. Here is the only known picture of Ida B. Wells um, from that day. And this was a very hard artifact to find. Um, but it says that Mrs. Bell Squire, Virginia Brooks, and Ida B. Wells. So those are the two women that are on either side of her as well. The suffragists from Illinois had some, um, I don't know what that word says, 
regarding the presence of Negro women, Miss Ida B. Wells, in their ranks during the Monday parade. Mrs. Bell Squire and Miss Virginia Brooks took Miss Barnett, metaphorically, under their wing, and the photograph shows the trio grouped together. The NAACP also has their own artifact. Um, this is this um, a newspaper called The Crisis that was published by the NAACP in 1913. They wrote this, where they, this is a little excerpt from the, their crisis newspaper entitled Suffrage Creators. And here is the section where they talk about her experience. In spite of the apparent reluctance of the local suffrage committee to engage to encourage the colored women to participate, and in spite of the conflicting rumors that were circulated, which disheartened many of the colored women from taking part, they are to be congratulated that so many of them had the courage of their convictions that they made such an admirable showing in the first great national parade. So, what were black women doing during suffrage? Nothing. Were they doing nothing? Um, Adela Logan, she actually is a black woman, but she passed very often as white um, in the South. And so sometimes she was able to go places and do things and give speeches in places black women weren't allowed until people started to realize, oh, she actually has black blood in her. She's a black woman. But she's talking about how more and more colored women are participating in civic activity. And women who believe that they need to vote also see that the vote needs them. So she is going around talking about how more and more women of color are participating. So what we know is that black women were active, right? They were doing it, but you didn't know any of their stories. And that's part of the problem, right? So why do you think their story was not included? Turn and talk. Why do you think their story was not included? Any of those stories? Tell you why, the way that the child, and then you can finish up that comment. So, why do you think their stories are not included? Because they said from the get-go it was a white movement. You buy all the iconography they used in their materials. Right. That's good. Somebody else have a guess? I don't have the answer. I mean, I'm going to show you my, my claim with my evidence, but what do you think? I thought other newspaper reporters were white men. Hmm. Perspectives of the person covering the stories matter. For sure. I can take that. Also, that you talk about. And when you talk about uh, the anti black racism work among global white suffragists, I can imagine those white suffragists elbowing out, not allowing black women to lead. Therefore, the women that we're talking about, of course, understanding the suffrage movement, it, um, it would be appropriate to say that black women participated in it, and black women were allowed. Mm. Good. So do you know of any anti-Black racism that was active among well-known white suffragists? Do you know any of those stories? Okay. Elizabeth Cady Stanton in 1869 said this, American women of wealth, education, virtue, and refinement. If you do not wish the lower order of Chinese, Africans, Germans, and Irish with their low ideas of womanhood to make laws, for you and your daughters to be your rulers, judges, and jurors, to dictate not only the civil but moral codes by which you shall be governed, awake to the danger of your present position and demand that women too shall be represented in government. What does that mean? Let's target every anti immigrant group That's in right. the US at the time. Yeah. <laughs> We've got a lot of immigration happening in the 1800s. And so they're saying, we don't like them, we don't like them, we don't, they, those groups have low ideas of womanhood and you should be scared. You don't want them making laws for you. But here's, here's my speaking point there. Bear with me. On the statements of uh, 1848, mm -hmm. the lead signer is Frederick Douglass. Yes, he is. And he is with them. And he was in 
divided specifically a barcode back. Mm -hmm. And so this to me screams, knowing that this to me screams an appeal to the racism of Americans as much as um, a, a racist comment of Elizabeth Gates here. The way because, because America is incredibly racist against the Big Sky. And appealing, and I think it's really interesting to start with Chinese because they were despised possibly the most in that time. It's very interesting to throw in German. That's why. Irish is what happened. Um, I love where you're sitting with that because those are questions you should always ask is what are some corroborating pieces of evidence that may suggest that these were her personal feelings, um, that she wants women to represent in government. And then I always have the question like, why was she hooking up with Frederick Douglass? Was it because they were trying to piggyback on the momentum of getting men the right to vote and say, how about us too? And they kind of said, well, well, well let's let us try to get it first. And then once we get it, we'll come around and help you. And why didn't that really work out the way that they maybe had hoped? Um, there's some evidence to suggest that perhaps Frederick Douglass didn't was not as committed to helping women get the right to vote as he was prior to men getting the right to vote. Um, so runs that, far deeper that, into the I think that's a really worthy investigation to learn more about Frederick Douglass. This is not center on him. This is really more about um, the intersection of race and gender here. So let's let's keep talking about that. So um, Carrie Chapman Cat also wrote um, this essay on women's suffrage. And here are some things that she said. She said, white supremacy will be strengthened and not weakened by women's suffrage. So she's saying, you know, you should help us because it will strengthen white supremacy. Because right now you've got black men voting and no white women. So if you let the white women vote, then we can go back to maybe outnumbering being stronger and it'll maintain white supremacy. Um, and she says here later on the next page, she says, if the South really wants white supremacy, it will urge the enfranchisement of women. Which kind of goes back to what you were saying, appealing to the racism, especially in the South, to go, if that resonates with you, then yeah, but those words, I find it hard to believe in my own personal examination of this evidence that anybody would say that if they didn't also believe it. And this essay is littered with those kinds of Alice Paul, in a letter to Alice Stone Blackwell, said, as far as I can see, we must have a white procession or that parade or a Negro procession or no procession at all. She was very concerned that Black or Southern suffragists would not march in the parade if Black people were allowed to march in the parade. Um, through the National Women's Movement, though they agreed, that the parade should be rife with political and social symbolism. They couldn't agree on one detail, which is how to deal with black suffragists at the time. Washington was segregated as a city, and Paul feared that by allowing black women in the parade, it would alienate Southern suffragists. So she quietly discouraged their participation, and then NASA finally decided that they should be able to march to the back of the parade. Uh, um, so is the story of the women's suffrage movement honest? And how do we start to grapple? I am at the very beginning of this investigation. So this was introduced to me in the fall that this white supremacy and these racist ideas existed among suffragists. I'm not saying I'm the first person to uncover that. I'm saying within my own self, this was a real a realization to me. And then I have been on a journey ever since then to go, what were they saying? What were they doing? And how did that contribute to maybe why Black people were not allowed to be a part of those act, that active movement and weren't featured in the parade and wasn't featured in the program and wasn't uh, talked about more widely, maybe in standards or textbooks, et cetera. All right, so present day connections. So in the C3 framework, they say, once you've talked to kids about any issue and they've investigated anything, how can they tie it to present day and then act on what they know. So kids can't act on what they know, then it goes back to the why did we bother even teaching it in the first place. So I'm going to give you one example, and then I want to hear from you to see if you can make any present day examples. When we talk about erasure, um, and that, that being kind of a theme that ran through here is that why are these stories not being told? The Me Too movement. In 2017, Alyssa Milano reached me to request her followers saying, if you've been sexually harassed or assaulted, write Me Too as a reply. 
But in the weeks after her tweet, the Me Too movement, which was actually created by a black woman, Serana Burke, created more than a decade earlier, became a widespread battle cry for those seeking to show that sexual harassment was not an isolated incident. So this was another example of where a lot of people said, hey, this is erasure because this black woman's been doing this for a long time, but why did it not get any attention until Alyssa Milano did it? And then they were accusing her of basically having hijacked it, knowing it was already a thing. And then she took it and ran with it and she got the notoriety. She got the interviews in the press and all of that until finally people started saying, whoa, 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 whoa. Toronto Brooks been doing this a long time. So why is Alyssa Milano getting all the credit? So that would be a great example to think about erasure and how that's currently happening. What are some other things that you can think about um, between what you learned about here with erasure, with voting, with counter narratives, with inquiry that you see as a connection to present day? I mean, in just in general, when yeah. the stories race, um, music, the origins of rock and roll being attributed to white yeah. men, notably Elvis. That's exactly right. That's good. Uh huh. Well, here, if you, I've done a very brief study, and you know, previous, this, Dr. Boss knows more, even more about this, but um, country music, a lot of um, there's a lot of evidence to say it was actually created in black communities, um, and then white folks took it away. He's nodding his head, yes, can't see him. Other connections between this and present day. We can expand it out beyond erasure of race to notions of cultural appropriation oh, as a method of erasure. You bet. And if I'm going to be really controversial, and you know where I'm going with this. Oh, let's go! Sororities and fraternities on university campuses oh. as cultural appropriation. All right, so let's talk about that. Well, they're um, co-opting um, ancient Hellenic culture. Um, the Fratchery, which was a military organization, not the social organizations that they use today. So they've completely misrepresented the oh. religious and military origins of the notion of Fratchery. Fascinating, says the historian of ancient Greece and Rome. Yes. I love that. I had no idea. Mm -hmm. That's good. And I even saw a recent, well, I was going back through the Volk Talks and I was watching them because I said I'm brand new here this year, right? And I saw one about Indian boarding schools as an act of genocide. Mm -hmm. And like that aligns exactly with what you were saying is absolutely those boarding schools are a type of genocide, for sure. Okay, um, we can even talk about like effort, the voting rights bills that can't get passed or restrictions to make it more difficult to vote and how it's adversely affecting black populations or even other populations of color. Um, and that's really important. So how can students take informed action? Um, when we talk about what are some things students can do with what they learned, I'm, I'm gonna give you just a couple of ideas really quick, and then I wanna hear from you. So this talks about what can students actually go and do? It could be go and do inside their class. It could be go and do outside of their class. And one of the things that I had students do is to write a textbook entry of some of the efforts of black women and put it into the textbook send that entry to a textbook company and say, hey, did you know that these stories also existed? Let's try to get them to be included. Um, with the National Arch or with the Library of Congress, I said, I am really troubled by the lack of representation here. I'm gonna go back pretty early on and see if I can find this one slide. So notice how this is kind of told chronologically in the women's suffrage movement. And then it says more to the movement. You would think, at least this is what I thought. I thought, oh, this must be present day, even though it's got an old thumbnail, so I was kind of confused, like that was weird. This is actually some women of color that they've kind of done as an addendum. Instead of embedding their efforts inside of these larger folders, they become the other folder. And so I called, I, I talked to them when I was there in person, I was like, I have a problem with that. It shouldn't be an other folder. They should be embedded in the story. So like those are the kinds of advocacy things that maybe students can do, or maybe they're featuring people in their school, not just for Black History Month, but all year long. Well, here are some the efforts of Black people and celebrating that brilliance and that innovation and whatnot. What are some ideas that you maybe have for how anybody, students or adults, 
can take informed action when they learn histories like this. Turn and talk, see if you can come up with an idea of what's something that they could do. I would do it. Even for that one. Oh, yeah. I'm on this, um, the other one that's really noticeable about that is put on its history.com. I tell I was somewhere. I would say it. But I know that there's the various in my over here. So. <laughs> I want to say that we have a little bit more than that. We just have the information. Well, then I started asking questions so, about like how does the collection get created? So I was asking, well, I, I was asking archivists, how did your collections come to be? Why did this happen? I don't know where they're at. I mean, you black artifacts are still there, right? Mm -hmm. She's like, yeah, that's a lot of our because so, they did, they did decide. But, well, she could tell me this because this is the But she was telling me about all these different collections that they got, and that they would get it from white folks. Because also, and they said, I'm not. I don't have the evidence to back this up. This is their claim. Is that they were um, there were people at the time that were of color who didn't trust the Library of Congress to take care of their art. Why? So they didn't give it to them. I can see why. Yeah, you can see why. <laughs> um, I do want to show you one other example here. If you're not familiar with the Library of Congress, they have this program called Buy the People. And all of these artifacts that they have on there, they are looking for people to volunteer to transcribe some of these things that are like in handwritten form. So you can actually have students go on there and take an article maybe of an unknown person or a, a counter narrative and they can go in and they can help transcribe it to now make that artifact more accessible for more people because then teachers can use those transcriptions in the classroom. So that could be another thing that they can do to take informed action. Did you come up with any good ideas in your groups about the kinds of informed action you could take? I suggested going to your local historical society mm -hmm. and looking at their exhibits. Yeah. Doing an analysis of it, mm -hmm. figuring out where you can input the voice, even if it's something as simple as putting up an exhibit of the slave cemeteries in your county. Yeah, that's good. Get some geography in there and history in there, and that's good. All right. So, oh yeah, I forgot I did that too. Um. So what we really want to encourage you to do and encourage students to do is like, I really appreciate what you all said about how it, before you can take action, you have to know the stuff, right? So no matter what you do, no matter how old you get, never stop learning the stuff. You can never know everything. Um, this is a topic I'm passionate about and I just came across this. Carrie Chapman Cat actually has some buildings that I, it's either Iowa University or it's um, Iowa State. I'll have to go back and look has some buildings on campus named after her. And there are students on campus that are fighting to get the name changed because of the racist comments that they know that she has made. And those are the ones where she talked about why supremacy will be strengthened with the vote. Um, and that was actually the thing I went, whoa, there's these, these are this is happening like in the past couple of years, um, that there are these protests. And I thought, oh my gosh, I need to learn more about that because I had never known that. But always trying to find those counter narratives what are the stories that are being told? Notice when it's only white people being talk, talked about and ask questions, where are people of color? Black, indigenous, other people of color. Um, where is the intersection between race and gender and other identities at play? And how is that informing what it is that we know and what we are, what we care about and how do we like challenge that? And by telling a more inclusive, history, then hopefully we can have students who better understand the world that they live in, and then they can actually do something to make the world a better place. Have to believe that. So thank you so much for coming. Um, that's my contact information if you're on the socials, but um, you can also find my email, 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 whatever. So thank you so much for coming. I would love to continue the dialogue. So if you have things that you find that are fascinating, oh, hey, you might want to use this, that'd be great. I'd love to talk to you. Or if you just want to challenge some of the things that you saw, let's talk about that too, because that's what historians do. 
they challenge each other, they talk about different interpretations of things, and um, always welcome that conversation. So thank you so much for coming. One hour. One minute.